Continuing on with our examination of the method of systematic theology, let's take just a couple moments and review what we've said in previous sessions. First of all, in the method of systematic theology, there needs to be a collection of the biblical materials. You may use a concordance or a computer program to look at the main words and the main themes that you are wanting to uh, discuss or wanting to study, and you bring all of this material together so that you can read it, meditate upon it, and digest it. You want to look for major and clear passages foremost. Secondly, you want to be sensitive to the process of biblical theology, remembering that in the New Testament you have probably a clearer, more final statement of a doctrine as opposed to in the Old Testament. God, as he has progressively revealed himself, has revealed himself with greater detail, which provides for us more clarity and an understanding of what God's final uh, goal is for his kingdom in our lives. So we need to be sensitive to this process of biblical theology. Next, we need to stay within the collection or the writings of a particular author. Paul, James, John, Peter, and Luke all had their own personalities, their own vocabularies, and they addressed issues from different perspectives. And so we need to make sure that we understand each author in their own particular approach to a question. Then we need to bring the unification of these biblical materials, the analogy of faith, the fact that Scripture interprets Scripture and that there is no contradiction within Scripture. And so we look at the Bible as a whole and seek to find the unification of these materials. We look at the analysis of the meaning of the biblical text through a proper approach of inductive Bible study. Observation, interpretation, correlation, and application. Bad method will produce a bad conclusion. Continuing on, then, we need to, in systematic theolo uh, theology, also appreciate the examination of historical treatments. For instance, the early church councils addressed issues like the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, the doctrine of the Trinity. These were early doctrines that were developed because of heresies that arose in the church. When we look at the false doctrine of uh, Jehovah's Witnesses today and Mormons, these are simply new uh, groups who are raising old, old doctrinal controversies. And so to go back to the church councils, we can find definitive answers to even some of the false doctrines today. We should also appreciate periods like the Reformation. You remember that Martin Luther was reacting against the indulgences, the selling of forgiveness by the papacy, by the organized Catholic Church in his day, and he was reacting against the works salvation that was put forth by the church. And so people like Luther, who have studied the doctrine of salvation and written upon it extensively, should be appreciated, should be read, and should be understood. John Calvin, another one, a person of great theological understanding, biblical study. The Reformation period should certainly be understood in the doctrine of salvation. In modern days, we would look at the doctrine of biblical inerrancy. Here is a doctrine that the church did not address for hundreds and hundreds of years because the church held to the authority, inerrancy, and accuracy of Scripture. But with modern-day biblical liberalism and textual criticisms, they began to attack the Bible, the veracity of the Bible, the truth of the Bible, and its accuracy. And so, a council of biblical inerrancy was formed and met for many years and produced a wonderful volume which defends the inerrancy, authority, and accuracy of Scripture. So, when we are studying systematic theology, we need to appreciate these historical treatments. Next, we need to identify the essence of the doctrine. 
The essence of the doctrine is the main thing that is being emphasized. We need, first of all, to have a separation when we look at the scriptures between what is permanent and what is temporal. A good question that we can ask ourselves is, is this a pattern of behavior or is this a pattern for behavior? Was this a pattern of behavior? This is the way that they did it versus this is a pattern for behavior. This is the way that we should do it also. We need to distinguish the permanent unvarying content of the doctrine from the cultural vehicle or cultural context in which it is expressed. Now, this is not a matter of throwing out the cultural baggage and throwing out the scripture because all of the scripture is written in a cultural context. The major question that we need to ask ourselves is when something is not cultural rather than when it is cultural. Just because something happened at a historically particular time for one particular New Testament church, for instance, doesn't mean that it's not applicable for all time. Church government might be an issue that one could look at in this context. The New Testament does not necessarily express only one kind or principle of church government. Certainly there's an emphasis upon pastors and elders and deacons. But how that all functions is not necessarily completely defined. And so we have to ask ourselves, is this a pattern of behavior the way that they did it? Or is this a pattern for behavior the way we did it? And we look for those principles that tell us that these teachings are timeless and that they go from period to period. Another example of this might be to greet one another with a holy kiss. Certainly this was a pattern of behavior and a practice in the New Testament time, but is this a pattern for behavior for us today? Well, these are questions that uh, we will address in the future in greater detail, but if you ever have the opportunity to take a class in Bible study methods or inductive Bible study, of which uh, Michigan Theological Seminary offers several, you should take that opportunity because method determines very often the quality of the message. The next thing that you need to be sensitive to in identifying the essence of the doctrine is the period in which the scripture is found. This would be called a dispensational analysis in the sense that in the Bible permanent truths are often expressed in the form of a particular application to a specific situation. An example of this would be the sacrifices of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, sacrifices were regarded as the means of atonement. We have to ask ourselves the question, though, as to whether this system of sacrifices, the burnt offerings, the lambs, the doves, is that the essence of the doctrine, or is it an expression of the doctrine? Is this the practice of the doctrine? Does the act of the sacrifice express the abiding truth, or is the abiding truth in the vicarious sacrifice itself for the sins of humanity? Galatians 3.23 says this, Before this faith came, that is the grace, faith of faith in Jesus Christ, Paul says, we were all held prisoners by the law, referring to the Old Testament, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come. We are no longer under the supervision of the law. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. The law, the Old Testament, is given to us to lead us to Christ, to expose the sinfulness of our sin, to show us the need of a substitutionary sacrifice, and then also, but more importantly, to lead us to the need of the final sacrifice, Jesus Christ, our Messiah. So when we do systematic theology, we need to look at the various periods, the periods of Old Testament, the periods of New Testament, the periods of a future kingdom, and look and understand what period is being addressed, and then what is the essence of the doctrine beyond what is just the practice of the doctrine. Also, we need to appreciate 
sources beyond the Bible. All truth is God's truth. For instance, God has created man in his own image, as the Bible teaches. So what does the image of God consist? And how can we, by examining human beings, how can we understand more about ourselves and more about God and more about the doctrine of man? If God's creation involves the rest of the universe, then natural sciences should help us to understand some of the revelation of God. Psychology can provide insights to man's behavior, while the Bible provides the foundational answers to man's problems. So the Bible is our primary text in systematic theology, but all truth is God's truth. The Bible is God's absolute true truth, and therefore everything else must be measured by it. But we do need to look and see what other insights we can get from the various sciences. Continuing on, we need to also look at a contemporary expression of the doctrine as the timeless truth as it how it applies today. We need to say, this is the doctrine, but how does it apply today? An example would be something like the issue of abortion. The Bible itself does not directly address the question of abortion. But there is a passage in the Old Testament upon which we can uh, build a timeless uh, truth and a timeless application. In Exodus 21:22, it says, If men who are fighting hit a pregnant woman, and she gives birth prematurely, but there is no serious injury, that injury to the woman or to the child, the fetus, the offender must be fined, whatever the woman's husband demands, and the court allows. But if there is serious injury to the woman or to the child in the womb, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. The principle here shows protection of life, protection of the woman and protection of the unborn child. And if the woman or the unborn child are violated or hurt or injured, then the court must extract a penalty. This certainly shows God's perspective of his protection for the unborn. Finally, we need to look at the development of a central interpretive theme. This deals with the question of, is there a unifying principle that would hold all of systematic theology together, or at least this major section of systematic theology? Calvin emphasized the sovereignty of God. Karl Barth emphasized the word of God. Jesus is the living word. Others emphasized the kingdom of God. But I would suggest that a central motif that may unify all of the Bible should certainly be seen as the glory of God. The glory of God is the message of Scripture. The glory of God throughout history, as he reveals himself to man, as he reveals himself in all of his greatness and in all of his glory. To God be the glory, great things he has done. For from him and through him and to him are all things, to God be the glory. And so we look at a central unifying motif that will bring all of Scripture together. Let's take another look at the conclusion of our method of systematic theology as we were talking about the need of finding, finding a central motif or a central theme that brings all of the Bible and all of systematic theology together. We suggested that the central motif should be the glory of God, the magnificence of God, the greatness of God in all of his actions and all of his words to us. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 8 says, Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was hidden, kept hidden in God who created all things. God's intent was that now through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers, to the authorities, in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose, which he has accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. God is seeking to reveal his eternal wisdom 
through Jesus Christ to the honor and to the glory of the triune Godhead. Romans chapter 11, verse 33 says, Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from God and through God and to God are all things. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we look at systematic theology, I think an important unifying theme is the glory of God revealed through his manifold wisdom throughout the ages. As we develop our systematic theology, we want to remember to emphasize what the Bible emphasizes, major on the majors and minor on the minors. Systematic theology should unite us, not divide us. And it is unfortunate that all too often the Christian church has been divided by its understanding rather than been united. We often believe and agree on 90 to 95 percent of the same things in, a, in systematic theology or in, in Bible interpretation. And yet we spend 95% of our time arguing about the 5%. We need to let love abound, respect, humility as we study the scriptures, and always have an open mind that when the scriptures reveal to us something different than what we believe, a willingness and openness to change ourselves rather than trying to change the scriptures or change others. We need to have at the very basis of our heart simply the desire to do God's will. And in order to do God's will, I must know God's word and the truth of God's word. And so my heart's desire is only to know God's truth so that I can know God's will. A humble attitude, a teachable attitude, will keep us understanding God's Word properly and applying it properly to our lives. Well, after we have uh, gathered all of this uh, material on our doctrine of systematic theology and we've studied the various passages, the next thing that we need to do is to bring a stratification of the topics through an outline. The final step in the theological method is to arrange the topics on the basis of their importance. This is in effect to say that we need to outline our theology, assigning major topics, subtopics, subordinate topics, and so on and so forth. We need to know that what the major issues are, what are the major things that are emphasized in the Bible, and we know we need to look at how we can divide these major topics into subtopics, issues that are important that will support the major, crucial, and indispensable truths of God's Word. Theology notes that the importance of its truth has to be founded upon the Scriptures. And so with each point in our outline, we seek to find the scripture that supports it. And in fact, we take the scriptures to produce the outline so that the support is very natural. For instance, the person could look at the doctrine of Christ and could arrange it in various subcategories. You could look at the pre-existent Christ. You could look at the earthly life of Christ. You could look at the heavenly ministry of Christ. You could look at the return of Christ or the eternal reign of Christ. All of these are important doctrines in understanding all about Jesus Christ. But which is the most important? What does the scripture emphasize first and foremost? And so as you develop systematic theology, and you will see in the coming weeks as we go into various doctrines, you try to major upon the majors. You need to assign degrees of authority. And this is part of the question of how strongly you hold on to a doctrine and when you find yourself with a greater openness. For instance, direct statements of Scripture are to be accorded the heaviest weight. For instance, 
you should love the Lord your God and your neighbor. Now, this is clearly affirmed in the scriptures. Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 and following. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus was asked this question by the young lawyer. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. For the believer in Jesus Christ, they can learn two commandments. They don't have to learn the 600 plus commandments of the Old Testament. If we as believers can understand these two principles, loving God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and loving our neighbor as ourselves, if these two laws, these two principles guide us, then we don't have to know all of the others because these two, if followed, will fulfill all the others. And so certainly a direct statement from Scripture, such as loving God and loving our neighbor, should have foremost prominence in a doctrine of systematic theology. After direct statements, direct implications of Scripture should also be given high priority. For instance, the question of a person avoiding sexual practices outside of marriage. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning at verse 16, says, Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For It is said the two will become one flesh, but he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside the body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple, the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Now, this particular passage does not directly address marriage. It addresses the question of immorality through prostitution and general sexual immorality. But the application is certainly true, and the application is addressed more clearly in other passages of Scripture, that a person should avoid sexual practices outside of marriage that a person should be faithful to their mate in marriage. And so this is a direct implication of Scripture, not directly stated in this passage, but certainly directly implied. The third principle or degree of authority would be probable implications of Scripture. That is, inferences that are drawn in cases where one of the assumptions or premises is only probable. They are less authoritative than direct implications. For instance, an example, we could say you should attend church each Sunday and Wednesday to grow as a Christian. Now, that's certainly a wonderful principle and a good principle. But what happens if in your culture, Sunday is not the day in which you meet? Or Wednesday is not the night of your prayer meeting? We need to see the principle here, the implication But we cannot be as dogmatic because it is not a direct statement. Now, Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 23, says this, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, here's the principle. The principle is believers in Jesus Christ are to gather together. They are to gather together for worship. They are to gather together to encourage each other in love and good deeds. They are to gather together as a habit and to look forward to the day of Christ's coming. It doesn't say it's Sunday. It doesn't say it's Wednesday. But it says that we should have that regular habit. Let's not be involved in churchianity. Let's be involved in Christianity, meaningful meetings where we encourage each other. Next, we have inductive conclusions from Scripture. 
And these vary in their degree of authority. Inductive investiga uh, investigation, of course, gives only probabilities. The certainty of its conclusions increases as the proportion between the number of references actually considered and the total number of pertinent references, which could conceivably be, con con could conceivably be considered, increase. Let me give you an example. We can say by inductive study, a person should exercise to take care of their body because it is the temple of God. 1 Timothy 4.17 says, Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Inductively, we can argue that physical training is of some value, but we cannot define exactly what that physical training is. Therefore, we must be more open. Deductive conclusions, the mode of baptism, the timing of communion, these kinds of things. Yes, the Bible speaks of baptism, and it's important, but does it speak directly to the mode or the timing of communion? How often is it going to happen? These are things that we see in scriptures, but we must be more tentative about concerning the frequency or the way they are done. Conclusions inferred from general revelation outside of the Bible, which is less particular and less explicit than special revelation, must accordingly always be subject to a clear and more direct statement from Scripture. Things we learn from the study of creation, anthropology, sociology, and psychology cannot be elevated to the uh, level of Scripture. And we could suggest things for the believer in Jesus Christ, but we certainly cannot demand them as we see in the direct statements of Scripture. So the method of systematic theology is so very important, and we need to follow this method so that we will have an accurate message. The method will determine the accuracy of the message. Systematic theology must be based upon a systematic study of God's Word.